Hey, I am Michael Shermer, the director of the Skeptic Society, the publisher of Skeptic Magazine. We investigate claims of the paranormal, pseudoscience, and fringe groups, and cults, and claims of all kinds between. Science and pseudoscience and non-science, junk science, voodoo science, pathological science, bad science, non-science, and plain old nonsense. And unless you've been on Mars recently, you know there's a lot of that out there. Some people call us debunkers, which is kind of a negative term, but let's face it, there's a lot of bunk. And we are like the bunko squads of the police departments out there flushing out. Well, we're sort of like the Ralph Naders of bad ideas, <laughs> trying to replace bad ideas with good ideas. I'll show you an example of a bad idea. I brought this with me. This was uh, given to us by NBC Dateline to test. It's, the, uh, it's produced by the Quadro Corporation of West Virginia. It's called the Quadro 2000 Dowser Rod. <laughs> this was being sold to high school administrators for $900 a piece. It's a piece of plastic with a Radio Shack antenna attached to it. You can douse for all sorts of things, but this particular one was built to douse for marijuana in students' lockers. <laughs> so the way it works is you go down the hallway and you see if it tilts toward a particular locker and then you open the locker. So it looks something like this. I'll show you in it. Oh. It, well, it has kind of a right-leaning bias, so I'll show you. Well, this is science, so we'll do a controlled experiment. It'll go this way for sure. Ah. <laughs> sir, you want to empty your pockets, please, sir? <laughs> so the question was, can it, can it actually find marijuana in students' lockers? And the answer is, if you open enough of them, yes. <laughs> but in science, we have to keep track of the misses, not just the hits. And that's probably the key lesson to my short talk here is that um, this is how psychics work, astrologers and tarot card readers and so on. People remember the hits, they forget the misses. In science, we have to keep the whole database and look to see if the number of hits is somehow uh, stands out from the total number that you would expect by chance. In this case, we tested it. We had two opaque boxes, one with government-approved THC marijuana and one with nothing, and it got it 50% of the time, <laughs> which is exactly what you'd expect with a coin flip model. So that's just kind of a fun little example here of uh, the sorts of things we do. Skeptic is the quarterly publication. Each one has a particular theme. Like this one is on the future of intelligence. Are people getting smarter or dumber? I have an opinion of this myself because the business I'm in. But in fact, people, it turns out, are getting smarter. Three, three IQ points um, per, per 10 years going up. Sort of an interesting thing. With science, don't think of skepticism as a thing, or even science as a thing. Are science and religion compatible? It's like, is science and plumbing compatible? These, they're just two different things. Science is not a thing, it's a verb. It's a way of thinking about things. It's a way of looking for natural explanations for all phenomena. I mean, what's more likely that, that extraterrestrial intelligences or multidimensional beings travel across the vast distances of interstellar space to leave a crop circle in Farmer Bob's field and pucker brush Kansas to promote skeptic.com or webpage, or is it more likely that a reader of Skeptic did this with Photoshop? And in all cases, we have to ask, <laughs> what's the more likely explanation? And before we say something is out of this world, we should first make sure that it's not in this world. What's more likely, that Arnold had a little extraterrestrial help in his run for the governorship, or that the World Weekly News makes stuff up? <laughs> And part of that, the same theme, is expressed nicely here in the Sidney Harris cartoon. For those of you in the back, it says here, then a miracle occurs. I think you need to be more explicit here in step two. This single slide completely dismantles the intelligent design arguments. There's nothing more to it than that. You can say a miracle occurs, it's just that it doesn't explain anything, it doesn't offer anything, there's nothing to test. It's the end of the conversation for intelligent design uh, creationists, whereas, and, and it's true, scientists sometimes throw terms out as linguistic place fillers, dark energy or dark matter or something like that, until we figure out what it is, we'll just call it this. It's the beginning of the causal chain for science. For intelligent design creationists, it's the end of the chain. So again, we can ask this, what's more likely? Are UFOs, alien spaceships, or perceptual cognitive mistakes, or even fakes? This is a UFO shot from my house in Altadena, California, uh, looking down over Pasadena. And if it looks a lot like a Buick hubcap, it's because it is. <laughs> uh, you don't even need Photoshop. You don't need high-tech equipment. You don't need computers. This was shot with a uh, throwaway Kodak Instamatic camera. You just have somebody off on the side with a hubcap, ready to go, camera's ready, that's it. <laughs> 
So although it's possible that most of these things are fake or illusions or, or so on, and that some of them are real, it's more likely that all of them are fake, like the crop circles. On a more serious note, in all of science, we're looking for a balance between uh, data and theory. In the case of, of, of Galileo, he had uh, two problems when he turned his telescope to Saturn. Uh, first of all, there was no theory of planetary rings, and second of all, his data was grainy and fuzzy, and he couldn't quite make out what it was he was looking at. So he wrote that he has seen, I have observed that the furthest planet has three bodies, and this is what he, he ended up concluding that he saw. So without a theory of planetary rings and with only grainy data, uh, you can't have a good, good theory. And it wasn't solved until 1655. This is Christian Huygens' book in which he cataloged all the mistakes that people made in trying to figure out what was going on with Saturn. It wasn't until Huygens had two things. He had a good theory of planetary rings and how uh, the solar system operated, and then he had better telescopic, more fine-grained data in which he could figure out that as the Earth is going around faster according to Kepler's laws than Saturn, then we catch up with it and we see the angles of the rings at different, uh, different angles there, and that's in fact turns out to be true. The, the problems with having a theory is that your theory may be loaded with cognitive biases. So one of the problems of explaining why people believe weird things is that we have things on a simple level, and then I'll go to more serious ones, like um, we have a tendency to see faces. This is the face on Mars, which was uh, in 1976, so there was a whole movement to get NASA to photograph uh, that area because People thought this was monumental architecture made by Martians. Well, it turns out here's the close-up of it from 2001. If you squint, you can still see the face. And when you're squinting, what you're doing is you're turning that from fine grain to coarse grain. And so you're reducing the quality of your data. And if I didn't tell you what to look for, you'd still see the face because we're programmed by evolution to see faces. Faces are important for us socially. And of course, happy faces, faces of all kinds are easy to see. You can see the happy face on Mars there. If astronomers were frogs, perhaps they'd see Kermit the Frog. Do you see him there? <laughs> Little froggy legs. Or if geologists were elephants. Uh, religious, I <laughs> religious iconography. <laughs> discovered by a Tennessee baker in 1996. He charged five bucks a head to come see the nun bun until he got a, a cease and desist from Mother Teresa's lawyer. <laughs> Here's Our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of Watsonville. Just down the street, or is it up the street from here? Uh, tree bark is particularly good because it's nice and grainy, branchy, uh, black and white, splotchy, and you can get the pattern-seeking. Humans are pattern-seeking animals. Here's the Virgin Mary on the side of a glass window in Sao Paulo. Uh, here's the Virgin Mary made her appearance on a cheese sandwich, which I got to actually hold in a, a Las Vegas casino, of course, this being America. <laughs> This casino paid $28,500 on eBay for the, for the uh, cheese sandwich. But who does it really look like? The Virgin Mary? It has that sort of puckered lips, uh, 1940s era look. Virgin Mary in Clearwater, Florida. I actually went to see this one. Um, there was a lot of pe people there of the faithful come to be in their um, wheelchairs and crutches and so on. And, uh, we went down and investigated this to give you a size that's Dawkins, me, and the amazing Randy next to this two, two and a half story size image. All these candles, so many thousands of candles people had lit in tribute to this. So we walked around the backside just to see what was going on here. Where, it turns out wherever there's a sprinkler head and a palm tree, you get the effect. Here's the Virgin Mary on the backside, which they started to wipe off. I guess you can only have one miracle per building. <laughs> So is it really a miracle of Mary, or is it a miracle of Marge? <laughs> and then I'm going to finish up with um, another example of this uh, uh, with audio, uh, auditory illusions. Um, there's this, this film, White Noise, with, with Michael Keaton about the, the dead talking back to us. By the way, this whole business of talking to the dead, it's not that big a deal. Anybody can do it. Turns out it's getting the dead to talk back. That's the really <laughs> hard part. In this case, um, supposedly, uh, these messages are hidden in electronic phenomena. There's a reversespeech.com webpage in which I downloaded this stuff. Here is the forward, this is the most famous one of all of these. Here's the forward version of the very famous song. If there's a button in your hedgerow, don't be alone there. It's just a sprinkly for the main queen. Yes, there are two paths you can go back. But in the long run And there's still time to change the road you're Boy, can you just listen to that all day? <laughs> All right, here it is backwards, and see if you can hear the hidden messages that are supposedly in there.
What'd you get? Satan. Satan. Okay, well, at least we got Satan. Now, I will prime your auditory part of your brain to tell you what you're supposed to hear and then hear it again. <laughs> You can't miss it when I tell you what's there. All right, I'm going to just end with a, a positive, a, a nice little story about the Skeptics is a, a, a nonprofit educational organization. We're always looking for little good things that people do. In England, there's a, a, a pop singer, very one of the top popular singers in England today, Katie Malua, and she wrote a beautiful song. It was in top five uh, for in, 19, in 2005 uh, called uh, Nine Million Bicycles in Beijing. It's, it's a love story. She's sort of the Nora Jones of, of the UK about how much she loves her guy and compared to nine million bicycles and so forth. And she has this one passage here. We are 12 billion light years from the edge. That's a guess. No one can ever say it's true. But I know that I will always be with you. Well, that's nice. Um, at least you got it close. In America, it would be we are 6,000 light years from the edge. Uh, <laughs> But my friend Simon Singh, the uh, particle physicist now turned science educator, and he wrote the book The Big Bang and so on, uses every chance he gets to promote good science. And so he wrote an op-ed piece in The Guardian about Katie's song in which he said, well, um, we know exactly how, how old, the, how far from the edge, you know, it's 13.7 it's billion light years. And it's not a guess. We know within a precise error bars there how close it is. And so we can say, although not absolutely true, that it's pretty close to being true. And uh, to his credit, Katie called him up after this op-ed piece came out and said, I'm so embarrassed, I was a member of the astronomy club and I should have known better. And she recut the song, so I will end with the new version. We are 13.7 billion light years from the edge of the observable universe. That's a good estimate with well-defined error problems. And with the available information, I predict that I will always be with you. How cool is that? Oh. <laughs>